Hey, good morning, everyone. Uh, hey, have you had a conversation that is both verbal and nonverbal all at the same time? Let me give you an example. So recently in our house, um, there's been a conversation where I have talked to our son, Ian, who's six, and I've said to him, hey, buddy, can you pick up those socks that you threw across the room and put them in your room in a laundry basket? Or, hey, can you pick up those shorts that are on the couch and put those in the laundry basket in your room? Now, here's the kicker. If my husband, Kyle, is within earshot of this conversation between myself and my son, our son, he will look at me, we will lock eyes, and a nonverbal conversation will begin. And it looks something like this. He will look at me as I'm talking to Ian, or when I just got done giving him those instructions, and he'll be like. And at the same time, I respond by. <laughs> and then when we're in the kitchen, and the kids aren't in the kitchen, Kyle will say verbally, wow, it's really interesting that you tell our son to put his clothes in the laundry basket when you cannot seem to get your pile of clothes that is on our bedroom floor into the laundry basket, which is just inches away from your pile of clothes. I know I'm not alone. I know I'm not alone. How many people have piles of clothes on their floor? Also, we're gonna use that as an example. What is your pile of dirty laundry today? Because we're in the week that we've all been waiting for. Welcome to, I wanna believe, but there are so many hypocrites in the church. There are so many hypocrites in the church. So we're gonna dive into that topic today and uh, this whole series was developed by you. There were many of you that answered the question, what do you struggle to believe about faith or about God? We piled all those answers together, came up with these really amazing topics, very tough, difficult topics. Thank you, my work has been cut out for me preparing for each of these weeks. Uh, but this one is uh, real good and I believe that God's got something for all of us and, and it's gonna be personal um, for each of us. And so let's, let's dig in. First, let's break down the definition of a hypocrite. Okay, let's break down what, we, we hear the word, we hear hypocrisy, and we have a lot of thoughts that go in our head. We probably have a lot of experiences that start to go in our mind. Let's break down what's the definition. Yourdictionary.com says, a hypocrite is a person who pretends to have certain beliefs, attitudes, or feelings when they really do not. Said another way, a person who acts in contradiction to his or her stated beliefs or feelings, simply put, somebody who says one thing and does a different thing. Somebody who says something but does something completely opposite. Let's, let me share some examples. It might be like a company who has their stated values and they're on the wall or they are in your, when you join that company, it's in the, the HR manual and everybody talks about it and one of the values is having fun. But if you were to spend a day with this group of people, you would have other words to describe what it's like, and fun is not one of them. <laughs> so there's a disconnect between what they say they value and how they behave. Another one, a student, maybe that straight A student who is very passionate and driven and loves their studies loves to do their homework even because they're just really, uh, they take a lot of pride in their work. And they talk about that at home and they talk about it with the people in their house. But when it comes to spending time with friends, they downplay that and they shrug it off and they might even say, oh, I don't care about school. And they spend time gaming instead with their friends because the pressure of that environment leads them to downplay some of who they are, and it doesn't match up. A person who acts one way with one group of friends acts a completely different way with their church friends. 
and it doesn't quite add up. See, hypocrites are everywhere. Hypocrites are everywhere. But the truth is, we put a magnifying glass on hypocrites in the church. And I want to explain why I believe that is, why I think that is, and we're going to unpack it here. And here's why I think we put a magnifying glass on hypocrites in the church. And it's because when we have experiences with the church that don't match our expectations of the church, we don't know what to do with that. I'm going to say that one more time. When we have experience, when we have expectations of the church and it doesn't match our experiences with the church, there's tension there. And we expect, and we really should expect, the church to be the healthiest place on earth. That's a fair expectation to have. After all, it's the hope of the world. Jesus called the local church to be the hope of the world. But what you and I experience or have experienced doesn't always match up with that expectation. Maybe some of you, you would explain your growing up years to be one where your whole family got all dressed up and you went to church and you sat in a chair and maybe there, you and the rest of your family nodded along with the message, but when you went home, there were things that were happening in your home or there were behaviors that you saw in your family that didn't line up to what you were learning or what was being taught on Sunday, but it felt like it was more important to dress up and look put together than it was to be real and to be authentic. Uh, maybe for some, maybe you've heard the message that it's more important that you attend, more important that you attend and you show up than it is, on, than it is the importance of treating your coworker at work, that it would be more important to attend church than it would be important to love the person that you work with. And I think, again, we could all sit around the table. We could sit across from one another and you and I could share stories of how we have been hurt and how our expectation of the church didn't match up with our experience in the church. And we could share stories of how that hurt us. And I just want to say, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you've been hurt. I'm sorry that there's hurt there that's caused with this idea that there's a difference between what we hope for and what we experience. And what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about the vision that Jesus had for the church. From the very beginning when Jesus came here as fully human and fully God, the vision that he had for the local church and what he meant for it to be and how you and I play a very significant part in that. And so let's get a picture of exactly that. In Matthew chapter 16, there's a moment where Jesus is with his followers and he's asking them, hey, what's the word on the street about me? Basically, he's saying like, what's, what are people saying about who I am? And they respond to him and they say, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say Elijah, others say Jeremiah, others say another prophet. And then in this moment, Jesus gets real personal, which you and I have to pay attention to any time that we're reading in scripture and Jesus gets real personal. He's so good at that. One thing I just love is that Jesus knows how to get to the core. And today is a get to the core kind of message. What Jesus shared in that moment is then he said, who do you say I am? He turned to the people that were following him and he said, who do you say I am? And if you've been here at Prairie Heights over the last five weeks, week number one of this series, we talked about that exact question. The reason we are doing this series, I want to believe, but is so that you can decide and you can know what you believe and why you believe it. And the core of our belief comes in this very question 
that Jesus asks, who do you say I am? That's the very answer that you've got to grapple with because the answer to that question changes everything else. And so here's how Peter responds. Peter responds to Jesus and he says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And then we get in Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus gives us a picture. And he says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus says, and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. The church is built on Jesus. The local church is built on Jesus. The church is built on a faith like Peter's. It's built on a foundation of a belief of who do you say Jesus is. The church is built on Jesus' life, his teaching, and his leadership. This local church is a group of people who we all have different experiences, life experiences, growing up experiences. We're coming together from a wide variety of backgrounds. We're coming together as one local church who is here to connect one more person with Christ and a church family. And here's where it gets really messy. Here's where it gets real messy. And here's what we have to understand is that we have people who are here for the very first time and maybe you haven't checked out church either ever, you've never been part of a church, or you grew up going to church but walked away and are now just coming back and checking it out again, and you're not really sure what you believe about Jesus, you haven't, you haven't made a decision to follow Jesus yet, We've got many people who have made that decision to follow Jesus and you come every week and your heart is open to what God would want to teach you and, and you're working at what that means to you personally and in your home and in your work life and there's evidence of Jesus in your life. Here's where it gets really messy. When Jesus called the church the hope of the world, and when you and I, when we believe that hope, when we believe it, but we don't act it. When we believe that hope, but we don't act that hope. We aren't helping. Right? We aren't, we aren't helping. That's me, that's you. And that exposes the gap. So when there's a gap in our expectations and our experiences, when there's a gap between what we believe and how we act, when there's a gap between how we feel and how we present ourselves, what do we do with that? What do we do when that happens? Because it happens, and it doesn't just happen in church, it happens everywhere. Because the truth is, there is a gap between our expectations of the church and our expectations with the church. And let me go this one step as we continue on, because the church is who? The church is people. The church is us. We are the church. And so the gap isn't in the 66 books of the Bible and in the teachings of here. The gap isn't in Jesus. The gap is in us. It's in me and it's in you. That's the gap. And that's the gap that we experience when we have the expectation of the church, but with the church. When we have an expectation of people, but we're with people. Like it gets really messy really fast. But you know what? Like that's not an excuse to accept the gap. Like we're not just gonna end there. I'm not gonna close up all my notes and say, see you later, have a good Sunday. <laughs> There's the gap. You're the gap, I'm the gap. Like, we're not just gonna accept that, we're just gonna recognize that that's our reality, okay? And we're gonna start from there, and we're gonna do our best to not stay there, 
to not widen the gap, to not leave the gap as much as we can. And, and there's hope because if we really believe, if we really believe that Jesus transforms lives, if we really believe that when you and I say, when we answer the question, who is Jesus? And when you and I say, Jesus, you are the Lord and leader of my life, I'm gonna follow you. If we really believe that that means the power of the Holy Spirit is in us, and if we really believe that that is, has the potential to change us from the inside out, there's hope. There's hope that we can close the gap. There's hope that we can live a life that aligns. There's hope that when we say one thing that it can actually match up in every area of our life. But I know and you know there's a whole lot of roadblocks in the way from that picture. Right, and so let's, let's talk a little bit about how do we close the gap? How do we close the gap between our expectations and our experiences. So let's go back to Jesus and Peter to discover how to close the gap. Jesus tells Peter, and I already read it, and I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Whew, can you imagine being Peter and hearing those words from Jesus? Can you imagine like the, the empowerment <laughs> you would feel, also probably the inadequacies. <laughs> but here's what I want us to pay attention to. It says, you are Peter. Jesus says, you are Peter. And in this context, in this exact scripture, what it, Peter means, the, the name Peter, I'm gonna go a step further here. I'm just getting real excited, so I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the name Peter means rock or stone. The name Peter means rock or stone. And going a step further, in this context, Jesus is using rock as what he's gonna build the church off of. What does he mean? That the rock is a steady foundation of faith. He's explaining that Peter, the name Peter, he gives Peter identity. He says, you are Peter, you are a rock. And he says, on this rock, not on Peter, not on a person. He says, on this rock, what does he mean? He means the faith and the belief that Peter has. When Peter says, you are the Messiah, you are the son of the living God, on that faith is what the church is built on. The church is then built on the Jesus' life, leadership, and teaching. And in this moment, we see Jesus giving identity and giving purpose to Peter. And that is the very first step that you and I have to recognize in our ability to close the gap between expectation and experience is you and I gotta know who we are in Christ. We gotta know our identity. We gotta know who God's made us to be. Because do you remember the definition that I gave earlier about hypocrite? There was a word that stood out to me when I looked it up, pretend. We have to stop pretending. We gotta stop pretending. Stop pretending you are somebody you aren't around this group of people or that group of people. So the first thing we gotta do is we gotta reflect. You gotta spend time reflecting, and I want us, you can start that today, in this moment, but I would encourage you over this week, spend some quiet time with Jesus in reflection. Is there any area of your life where your words and your actions are not matching up? Any area. Is there any area of your life where what you say doesn't match up with what you do? The second question that you can reflect on and you can think about is, what do you believe? Why do you believe it? What do you believe about God, about faith, and why do you believe that? 
What do you believe about, pick another category. What do you believe about that and why do you believe it? Know your convictions. Know what you care about. Know yourself really well. Ask yourself, how do you feel? Are you honoring those feelings? Like how you feel on the inside, is that, how, are you honoring that by sharing that? Or are you hiding it, ignoring it, denying it? The next question, are you more concerned with who people want you to be or who God made you to be? And I don't care if you are sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, high school, ninth grade, tenth grade, senior, junior, 60 years old. I think you and I get trapped in this one all the time. Are you more concerned with who people want you to be or who God made you to be? Because here's the truth. The truth is God made you on purpose for a purpose. And he didn't make a mistake when he made you. He uniquely wired you. He made you like nobody else. Isn't that crazy to think about? I'm going to do a whole series about this. I could legitimately talk the next three hours about this idea. <laughs> because God made you like nobody else. So like, if that's a hard place for you right now, if you don't know how to answer the question like, who am I? Here's a couple things, and, and they're just very practical. You gotta start reflecting and know who you are. Take some assessments. Figure out your personality. Figure out your temperament. Figure out why you do some of the things you do. Um, ask some people that are closest to you. You can take a spiritual gifts test to find out the spiritual gifts that are in you, and you can just simply Google that, and you can find a free one anywhere. Another way to find out more of who you are is get closer to Jesus. Because just like he told Peter, he said, you are Peter. And maybe for some of you today, you just need that. You need to fill in that Peter's name with your name. And you just need to hear God say, you are. And your name is, is part of your identity. And you need to know who God made you to be. So that you can be less concerned with who other people want you to be. You know, uh, if you have a chance, if you have, many of you have, if you haven't yet, I want to encourage you, uh, look up some of the stories about Peter. You can really get an idea of who he is, of his personality, because there's some patterns and some themes to the way that he behaves. And Jesus, when he comes to call Peter to follow him, Peter was formerly a fisherman, and he's out fishing, and Peter says, come, or Jesus says, come and follow me, and Peter just immediately stops fishing and follows him. He doesn't ask any questions. He doesn't anything. He just stops, and he goes. There's another moment in Scripture where uh, Jesus is walking on water, and Peter's in the boat, and Peter just gets out of the boat and starts walking on water. Like, he doesn't even think about it. The minute he starts thinking about it, he starts sinking, which that's, again, a whole nother sermon. But when you think about who Peter is, it's like he's this guy of just bold faith. That he's just gonna go after it. He's just gonna follow. He's just gonna obey Jesus. When Jesus says something and Jesus speaks and Jesus calls him to something, he's gonna say, yes, I'm in on that. I'm gonna follow. Where are you at today with your tenacity to follow? with your courage and your boldness to follow because God made you brave. God made you bold. And a lot of times when God calls us into obedience, we look foolish. There's times where Peter looked foolish. Here I'm gonna unpack one of those times. And we're gonna learn from him. We're going to learn a little bit about relationship and we're going to learn about what happens when, when you and I believe one thing and do another thing. 
We read about a time where Jesus is predicting that Peter is going to deny him. And you can find that story in Matthew 26, verse 31. And here's what it says. It says, then Jesus told them, he told his followers, this very night you will all fall away on account of me, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He's saying, all my followers, all my closest friends, all the people I've spent the most amount of time with, you're all going to leave. You're all going to scatter. Jesus goes on to say, but after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. And Peter replied in a very Peter personality way, even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. Peter says, I never will. I'm with you, Jesus. I never will. 34, truly I tell you, Jesus answered, this very night before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. But Peter declared, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the other disciples said the same. Peter said, I'll never disown you. Peter is arrested. And then he is in front of everyone, where then he is sentenced to death. And now we read just a little while later in verse 69. It says, now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard and a servant girl came to him. She said, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said, but he denied it before them all. I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway where another servant girl saw him and said to the people, this fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. He denied it again with an oath, I don't know the man. After a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a, ro a rooster crowed and then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. Have you ever had a Peter moment? Have you ever had a time that you stood strong in your conviction? You told Jesus, I am with you and I'm for you and I'm gonna follow you. And then when life happened and something happened, you backed away from that. You denied that? See, Peter didn't deny Jesus just once, not just twice, but three times. And what I think is important is for you to reflect. Is there anywhere where you have believed one thing or you believe one thing and you've acted another? Closing the gap means you've got to reflect on that. You've got to be honest about that. The second thing you need to do is you need to reveal it and repent. You know, it's very possible as you're going on with your life that you don't even know where you've been hypocritical. Do you see how Peter, it's like as we read through the story, I mean, just moments before, Jesus is telling him, hey, God, Peter, you're gonna disown me. And he's like, no, I won't. I never will. Moments later, Someone came to him and he said, I don't know the guy. He denied it. He denied it. And then if you read in scripture, like I just did, if you, if you notice the two words, the first two denials, it said he denied, he denied. The third time it says, then he began to call down curses and he swore to them, I don't know the man. Isn't it interesting? The more you and I lie to ourselves, the longer we lie to ourselves, we deny it the first couple times. By the third time, we actually start believing it. He swore to them. I don't know the man. And then he heard the rooster crow. And I think sometimes what happens for us is we hear the Holy Spirit. We have a, a really good friend who comes and convicts us. And we're faced, we have to reveal 
our, we have to reveal the truth. And we have to reveal what's happened and then we gotta repent. We've gotta repent. But it takes being honest with yourself. It takes integrity to do the right thing. It takes integrity to do the right thing even if it'll cost you. So where's your denial today? Where's your denial today? Is there any area of your life that it's easier to put the blame out there? To like, and there's plenty of blame to go around, right? Pick a circumstance. <laughs> and you're probably justified in who's to blame, but what's your part? What's your part? What, what is being revealed about you and who you are? And, and I'm sitting here asking all of you and I'm telling you, God's doing it in me too. We're in this together. God's doing this in me too. And I know, I know these aren't easy questions. So we need to reflect, we need to reveal, we need to repent. And the last thing is we need to restore. You know, Jesus, when he died a brutal death on a cross and he rose again, and how he said, I'll meet you, I'll go ahead of you into Galilee, and there's a moment where Peter and Jesus are at the beach. We'll say they're at a lake, okay? A lake, like a Minnesota lake. And they're at the lake, and they're around a bonfire. So imagine being around a bonfire at the lake with your closest friends and with Jesus. And they're sitting there, and Jesus says, Hey, do you love me, Peter? He says, yeah. He says, do you really love me? Peter's like, yeah, I love you. And Jesus says again, but do you even love me like a friend? And like Peter's annoyed by the third one, which it's like, Peter, did you forget? <laughs> Why are you annoyed by Jesus asking you three times when you denied him three times? And you know, God's just real good, and he knows our heart. He knows what Peter needed, and in that moment, he was simply saying, Peter, do you love me like more than a brother? Do you love me like more than a friend? Do you even love me as a friend? Where's our love at? And that was a restoration, because he asked him three times the same amount of times that Peter denied him, and they restored relationship. And so where does restoration need to happen? For you, is there restoration that needs to happen? You know what Peter went on to do? Jesus said, I will build my church on this rock. The faith and the boldness that Peter had in his walk with Jesus, he went on to lead the early church. You can read all about it in Acts. Thousands of people came to know Jesus. Thousands of people repented and were baptized. And it wasn't because of Peter. It was because of a belief in Jesus and a faith in Jesus. Because of a relationship with Jesus. Jesus just chose to use Peter the same way he chooses to use you and I. Today. He calls you to an identity. He made you. He's calling you to a purpose. He has you exactly where you are on purpose. And he's called you to that. The last scripture I want to read comes from 1 Peter. It's Peter who's writing this, and he gives us a picture of the church. 1 Peter 2, verses 5 through 8. It says, You also, like a living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone. And the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. He's saying, when you answer the question, who is Jesus to you? And you begin building your life on that faith and that belief. You are a stone, you are a rock that is building up the church. And the church can't be built with one rock or one stone. The church is a body.
and it needs everybody. It needs all of us. Peter goes on to say, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. Here, I want to explain that for just a second. Peter is talking to those who have not yet put their faith in Jesus. And he's just saying, hey, you were made to be in relationship with Jesus. And this question of who Jesus is to you is going to keep being a stumbling block in your life you're gonna continue to stumble and fall over this question until you decide and say yes to Jesus being the leader of your life. And you begin to walk with him and obey him. See, the church is a living spiritual house and we are all a part of it. Christ is the foundation. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the leader of the church. We are the church. We are the members. We are the body. I'm not the head of this church. Jesus is. We are all building our faith on the foundation of Jesus. No one person can make up a church. We are all a part of the church. We are the church. So to kind of tie this all in a bow, here's what I want to say. Hey, yeah, there's hypocrites in the church. And we're not going to deny that. We're not going to deny that there's a gap sometimes. And you and I play a part of that. We're not going to deny that there are hypocrites in the church because we are the church and we can be hypocritical at times. The second thing that we're going to do is we're going to stop pretending. Stop pretending to be somebody you aren't. Be who God made you to be. And when you recognize that you have failed, when you recognize that you have denied knowing Jesus, when you've believed in Jesus, when you recognize that you've fallen short, apologize. Reflect, reveal, repent, restore. When we fall short, We will do those things. And we'll close the gap between our expectations and our experiences. And here's the goal. (laughs) The goal is we're not going to settle with just saying there's a bunch of hypocrites in the church. We're going to try to be a little less hypocritical. (laughs) We're actually going to walk the walk. We're going to talk the talk. And we're going to close the gap. And we're going to have unity. Okay, and unity does not mean that we agree on everything. You can actually have unity and disagree. What unity means is we can unify around our values. And we're gonna talk, our next series, I'm so excited, it's called Simple Not Easy, and it's about all our values at Prairie Heights. That's what we're gonna unify around, is our values, the way we're gonna behave as a church family, and we will find unity in that. That will unify us. But there's a whole lot of other things that you and I can disagree on that together as a church family and your grow group and when you volunteer that you can disagree on with other people. Because if unity meant agreement all the time, I wouldn't be married. (laughs) Right? Do you know what my husband and I have unity around? We have unity around our home being centered on Jesus Christ first. Do we always live that out? No. Sometimes I have a heap of laundry that's two centimeters from the laundry basket and I don't serve my husband by putting it in the laundry basket. (laughs) But we center our faith around Jesus. We teach our kids about Jesus. It's real to us in our home. We unify around our values. We share the same values. Honestly, beyond that, There's not a whole lot of other things that we agree on. I'm not kidding. (laughs) Everything else kind of starts with a disagreement. But we have unity. We still have unity. And this church family has unity because we are centered on a faith and a belief of who Jesus is and we're gonna commit to closing the gap and walking that out. 
And when we don't, we're going to apologize. And we're going to walk it out. I love you. I'm so thankful for you. I pray today that God met you right where he needed to. Holy Spirit spoke to you. I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song. So let me do that. God, I'm so thankful for what you're doing in our midst. God, I'm thankful for how your Holy Spirit is moving and working. And God, thank you that we get to be church family. Thank you, God, that you are doing something that only you can do. And God, thank you for the reminder of having a solid faith foundation centered on you, God. Jesus, we're trusting you to show up in our lives. And not just show up for an hour on Sunday, but to show up 24-7 in our homes, in our workplaces, in our classes, at the gym, at the grocery store, in the parking lot, at the park. Jesus, would you show up through people, through us? Would you help us, God? We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen.